Hallelujah. This morning, um, I'm going to preach a message. You may have, you may recognize the title. Preached it similar to this back in 2016. But it came to my mind this week, and um, you know, there's no, no sense in reinventing the wheel, as it were. I feel that it's a word for the church, particularly uh, today. I'm going to read the entire chapter uh, of Acts 27. I normally don't read long passages for time's sake, but I, it is the entire story. And I'm reading it out of the New King James. It just flows easier in reading it out loud. If whatever version you have, if, if it's not the New King James, it's hard to read your version and, and hear me. So put it aside if you need to. But Acts chapter 27. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regime, a regiment. So entering a ship of Adra Medium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off Cnidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Sol Solomon. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidon, so when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, we all, uh, all hope that we should be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of, the law, uh, of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul, 
you must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now when the fourteenth night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about, night, uh, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And they took soundings and found it to be twenty fathoms, and when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said this centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach, unto which they planned to run the ship, if possible. And they let go the anchors and left them in the sea. Meanwhile, loosing the rudder ropes, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow struck, uh, stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Lord, I ask you for your help today in the preaching of your word, that this message, God, would be clear, that it would be concise, that it would be encouraging. Lord, I pray that it would do what you've intended it to do and that you'll help me in the delivery. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke writing this, he says, the winds were contrary. You understand what contrary winds are winds against you. Let's look at the journey we're on. We all set out with our great plans. I know everyone has plans. None of us plan uh, to... We all plan for success. We all plan for happiness. We all plan for peace and prosperity. Anyone not do that? We set out, we believe, you know, we're, we're setting a course. We have a destination in mind. No one plans on being shipwrecked. No one plans on failing, right? At least for the most part. No one plans on failing. You know, you start out, you, you say, oh, I'm going to be successful in business. I'm going to climb the corporate ladder. I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to build it up. I'm going to build a reputation. I'm going to make uh, a lot of money. With my money, I'm going to buy a big house. With the, I'm going to buy a big house. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to get a dog. <laughs> Two cars in the driveway, maybe a vacation home. That's my plan. I'm planning on success. No one plans otherwise. And each person has a different journey. I say that. We're all headed in basically in the same place, those of us who are children of God, but... My way is different than yours. The way that I take, it's a different road, generally speaking, than yours. But we all, we all wind up on the same road, on the same journey. But, but we all get there. You know, you, the way you have taken to get here is different than the way I have taken. 
Sometimes the journey is your own idea. You set out, it's a, it, the destination, the, the plan, the road is of your choosing. I am here because I want to be. Sometimes you're on your road, the road that you're on, on out of duty because it's expected of you. It's tradition, my family, whatever reason, I have to be here because it's expected of me. And sometimes the road we're on is completely out of your control. I'm here, but I'm not driving. I'm along for the ride. I can't change or alter one bit. I, I am not in control of my journey. But one thing is clear. I think we've all lived long enough to know that our directions sometimes change. Our journey, the road we're on, changes. Sometimes drastically, right? You know. I've shared this with you. I'll share it again. Um, you know, when I got, a, I was in Bible college. I went to Bible college. I was going to get my four-year degree. I was going to graduate, and I was going to go off into the mission field. I was going to be a missionary in Europe or wherever God led me. Three years into my degree program, a lot of stuff happened. Without getting into great detail, I was in Jimmy Swaggart Bible College back in the 80s. And you know what happened then. And everything kind of fell apart. Professors left, students left. It was total chaos. And um, I left the school. I finished my third, my junior year, without getting my degree. I have a diploma in pastoral ministries, just so you know, I have some kind of sheepskin. But I didn't finish my four-year degree, and I came home, not knowing what I was gonna do at that point in time. Planning on getting my degree, figuring out what I was gonna do. Well, I got a job. You needed, I needed a job, I got a job, and with the job came promotions, and I got promoted, and then, then I got married, and then I bought a house, and well, we had children, bought a house, and, um, and uh, everything changed. The road that I was on, the plans that I had, you know, not, I'm not sorry for that at all, but they changed drastically. I never got my degree, never finished my schooling. I took a church, Evangel Assembly of God, a little struggling church in Bridgeport, and, um, I, you know, my first pastorate, so excited to be a pastor. Became pastor of that church, and within a couple of months, we got a letter that we had lost the lease, and we had to move out. I uh, was inexperienced in this whole process, but we, we, found, a, we found another building in, in Stratford. It was a better community uh, for church, better access. It was just a better situation, or so we thought. And so we got a lease there, and the church began to grow. We were, we were running, you know, we were running about 100 people on a good, good, good Sunday. And uh, we had started teaching, started looking at how to, how to help the people in the church discover their spiritual gifts. Uh, I, I did too good of a job. Because when people discovered their spiritual gifts, they thought, well, why am I investing all of all this in such a little church? And they went off to a bigger church where they could invest their gifts you know, on a greater level. And uh, here we are, we lost people. And now we can't afford to pay the, more, the, uh, the, the lease and where we were. And so we moved into the Odd Fellows Hall in, in Stratford. And we were doing okay there. Except um, there were stag parties and the like on Saturday nights. And the people came in on Sunday morning. They didn't like the smell of beer and cigarettes. And so people figured they, no, they didn't want to stay there. And they left. And we closed, we closed the church. And all, everything, everything that, all the plans, all the dreams, everything was gone, done. Well, you know, many of you know the story that um, in the meantime, um, some of the pastors in the section, I had sent out letters and uh, one, one Thomas Fegler, <laughs> Pastor Thomas Fegler asked me to come and preach. He had become my friend. I didn't have that many Still don't. <laughs> but he had become my friend. In fact, he said, Mark, I am your friend. And he, um, I didn't think this was going to be emotional. <laughs> but he let me come and preach. And um, for two and a half years, I preached here when he was on vacation. He had other preachers come in. But, uh, but when he retired, you people asked me, 
to become your pastor. And it was, I have to say, one of the greatest days of my life. But I look back at my life. And, and you look back at your life and you say, I never, look where I am now. Never did I ever dream I would be here. Whether that is good or whether that's bad. You say, my, every plan I had, every, all my dreams, I went a completely different way. Everything has changed along the way. Look back at your life and see how many times your direction has changed. Sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. At least that's how it seems at the moment. I want to remind you right up front of what Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. There are two qualifiers there that we can't, we can't miss. One, all things work together for good to those who love God. And the same ones who are called according to His purpose. It's all His purpose. And if we love Him, and we acknowledge that we are called to His purpose, then everything, he, He's going to work all things together for good. This story in Acts chapter 27 is written by Luke, but it's about Saul of Tarsus later to become Paul the Apostle. Now here we read the story that Paul is arrested for preaching the gospel. Let's look at this man's life for, for a moment. He is, uh, he is Saul of Tarsus. He is um, a great... Um, a very powerful man in Jerusalem. He's well known. He had plans. He was a religious zealot. He was a Pharisee. In fact, he calls himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. In other words, one of the leading Pharisees of the day. He is going about doing what he believes is God's will. He is a Jew. He is, uh, he is a proclaimer of the law, strict keeper of the law. A and here is this this uh, uprising called the way, followers of this Jesus of Nazareth teaching this f false doctrine. And he, he's a, zealous, a zealot for Judaism, so he's got he's to put an end to this. And so he believes he's doing God's will, and he goes out and he's arresting and persecuting all of <coughs> anyone who is a follower of this Jesus of Nazareth. He, he really believes he's doing the right thing on, in his journey. He's a man who is greatly educated. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, who is one of the top leaders, teachers of the law of his day. Well-renowned and respected. And here is Saul of Tarsus, a protege of this great teacher. Saul, really, he had some credentials. But he's, he's on his way to Damascus to arrest and imprison and, and beat and, or kill Christians. And he encounters Jesus. You know the story. Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus. This is the risen Lord. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He speaks out of heaven. There's a great light that shines. The voice out of heaven, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And then Saul says, What? What would you have me to do? And his life is changed. His journey, his plans, everything that he had, all completely changed in a moment when Jesus steps into his life. Think about that. Listen. When Jesus steps into his life, everything changes. And he gave his life to Christ. I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. We use that terminology in the church when we talk about somebody who gets saved. Well, he gave his life to Christ. I gave my life to Christ back in 1981. Well, you know, yes, he came, he, he came forward. He, he prayed the sinner's prayer. He gave his life to Christ. What does that mean? Think about it for a moment. What does it mean to give your life to Christ? 
It means that your life is no longer yours. Because you gave it to Christ. And now that life that was formerly yours, that where you went the way you wanted or made plans, that life now belongs to Him. It's no longer yours. If you gave your life to Christ, it's His. As Paul said to the Galatians, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. It's now His life. So Saul of Tarsus, all his plans, all his experience, all his reputation, everything that he has, now because of fast tracking, because of his preaching of the gospel, he is arrested and he's condemned to death. He's condemned to die for violating the law, the Jewish law and uh, possibly the Roman law. He's condemned. He's condemned by the high priest who says he must die because he's a blasphemer. He's declared innocent by the governor. And he's almost set free by King Agrippa. But he's appealed to Caesar. And under Roman law, if you've appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you must go. And no one and nothing could stop it. He's now, his journey his plans are completely changed. And he is no longer driving. He is no longer in control. So I ask you this morning, whose prisoner is he really? Condemned by the high priest? Held in bonds? In Roman chains? Going under Roman law to see Caesar? Whose prisoner is he? Well, he tells us very clearly, Paul himself, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. See, I belong to Christ. I'm his servant. I'm his bond servant. I'm his slave. I, this life now is his. I'm his prisoner. He is in bonds for Christ. Remember? For the purpose of Christ. He's called unto God's purpose. Listen, it's immaterial how we get on this journey. We've all gotten here for, from some different backgrounds. Your backgrounds, are, I'm sure, are different than mine. I promise, I promise you. <laughs> Most of yours are different than mine. And mine than yours. And so forth. But the fact is, you are here now. You are where you are. It is what it is. You are in the journey that you are in right now. How you got there, we could argue and debate, but you're there. You're here now. I want to point out briefly, as briefly as I know how to, um, to do, I want to point out the close analogy between the course of a person's life through this world and the progress of a ship from port to port. And we'll get back to the story in Acts. We've, we've a planned destination, a particular port. Right? I'm going to start my business. I'm going to build my house. I'm going to have my family. I'm going to retire somewhere uh, on a lake, on a cottage with a boat and a dog. That's, and, and, you know, so we all, we all have that particular port, that destination. We take chances and we make changes along the way trying to, trying to get there. There are successes and there are disappointments. There are obstacles and disturbances that arise often when least expected. They pop out of nowhere and, and the direction changes. You say, How, where did that come from? How did that happen? I didn't see that one coming. The calm seas seem so few and far between. Amen. You're sailing along. Hey, this is good. This is great. Making great time. All's well. Look at the sunshine. Praise the Lord. And all of a sudden a storm arises out of nowhere. And you're, you're caught off guard. We sail along fine for a while. And then there's the turns for the worse. And our little boat comes into imminent danger. Paul, Luke writing of Paul's journey. He says the winds were contrary. Verse 4. The winds were contrary, blowing against us. It was a headwind. It was blowing the wrong way. You can't start up your, 
Johnson Motor. You can't, you know, you can't crank up your Evan Rude. You, you're, you're subject to the wind. And you can turn the sails to try and catch the wind to blow you. But, but when the winds are contrary, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow you the wrong way. You can't make distance. You, you, you're blown off course. The winds were contrary. You know, you take one step forward and two steps back. You know what I'm saying? Someone once said, the forwarder I go, the behinder I get. Like break dancing. Looks like you're going forward, but you ain't. Like walking up the down escalator. We used to do that as kids in the Trumbull Mall. Walk up the down. You know, you're walking, but you're not going anywhere. All of us have been there, some possibly now. You say, man, I can't. I can't make any distance, I can't make any headway, I can't, my course, I'm off course. I can't, I, I, it's out of my control. This is an interesting life, is it not? Interesting is a word. <laughs> Other words we could have plugged in there. This is an interesting life. It certainly is. We seldom get the big picture. I thank you that you're my friends and I can just talk because I know if you're my friend, I'm not boring you. But I know I told you this story many times. I've used this illustration. I, when I was in Federal Express Management, I learned how to drive defensively. And I also had to teach how to drive defensively. We used what they call the Smith method of defensive driving. Maybe you, you've used it or heard of it. All you have to remember is all good kids like milk. That's the, the letters. First of all, you aim high on steering. You want to avoid that? This is just good. This is just good information. For your driving, some of you need it. But for life in general, aim high on steering. You know when you're driving, if you look immediately at the I see some people, you know, they're they're up against the wheel like this. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. I don't know how they do that. You know, elbows bent, you know what I mean? Uh, but you aim high. You, you, you look ahead. You don't look right in front. Just right in front, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. There, there are dangers up ahead you can't see. And, you know, <laughs> since we're friends, I was driving with a, with a friend years ago, and we were taking turns driving, and we went down south. And, and after my turn of driving, he said to me, Pastor, I'm really, uh, you know, I'm really impressed the way, you, you know, how you do that. And I said, what? He said, the way, the way you keep the car within the, within the lines. <laughs> and he was serious. It's like, that's amazing. How do you do that? You, if you aim high on steering, if you look ahead, you don't have to. It, it, you, you see the road. You see the line. You, you will avoid. See, what you're doing when you're aiming high on your steering is you're being prepared for what lies ahead. You're avoiding uh, dangers that are ahead. So, you, so aim high. Look, you know, get the big picture. Look up and, and see what lies ahead. Don't, you know... And then there's getting the big picture. There's a broader perspective in our lives than, than most of us realize. There's a broader perspective. In other words, there's always more going on than at, than at first appears. Right? The surface is one thing, but there's always more going on. Get the big picture. Don't just look on the surface of things. Don't just take things that you see in here for granted. What is required here, friends, is discernment. And when I say discernment, I don't mean Webster's definition of discernment, where you take your knowledge and your wisdom and you, and you try and figure out what's going on. There's that kind of discernment. I'm talking about spiritual discernment as a gift of the Holy Spirit. The presence of God's Spirit in us to, to help us to discern not just the superficial things, but what's really going on so that we're not caught off guard. There's more at, more at play than what meets the eye. So get the big picture. Use your, your spiritual discernment. Keep your eyes moving. In other words, don't get tunnel vision. 
Keep your eyes moving. You're driving the car. You're supposed, you're supposed to be scanning your mirrors every five to seven seconds. Do you know that? You, your head should be on a swivel when you're driving, looking at the mirrors. Why? Do you know that more accidents happen from secondary? Let me, let me explain. A secondary than primary? In other words, somebody runs out in front, somebody cuts out in front of you, you're about to have an accident, and you turn quickly to avoid it, and boom! You crash into the guy that's been coming up on the side. He's been there all along. You just didn't see because you weren't keeping your eyes moving. Mo there are more accidents that happen from the secondary cause than from the primary cause. So, so you keep your eyes moving so that you know if, if there's an emergency, no, I can't go that way because there's a, there's a car coming. You follow me? Keep your eyes moving so that you're not caught off guard. That you can see all around you of what's really happening around you. So, so you, 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 get, you got me? So don't get tunnel vision. Leave yourself in out. You know, when you're driving, don't pull right up behind somebody in, in, at, at the red light. You know, the law says you're supposed to see their tires on the road. You know why? Well, first of all, in case somebody rear-ends you, you don't, you, know, you don't create a domino effect. But what if somebody... What if you have to get out? What if there's an emergency and you can't move because you're up against the car in front? So you leave yourself and out. Leave yourself some distance. Who cares if they beat beyond the horn behind you? It's about survival. It's a, so you leave your, in other words, don't get, don't get boxed into any, don't, don't get so concerned with tradition and uh, expectations and, uh, you know, uh, uh, emotions that you that you don't leave yourself an out. Am I making sense to you? M leave yourself an out, and then finally make sure they see you. You know that you're driving down the road and there's a person looking the other way, and you know they're going to cut out in front of you. Hit the horn. That's what it's for. It's not to say hey y'all. It's to get their attention. Hey, I'm here. Beep. And who cares if they cuss you out? Who cares if they, you know, if they give you a foul gesture? They saw you, and you didn't crash. Isn't that good? Amen. So beep the horn. Let them, make sure they see you. Make sure people know that you're there so, so that you don't, but as it relates to my message, friends, make sure they see you. Beep your horn. Me, you're a witness for Christ. You're, you're called on this journey to be a witness for Christ. Make sure they hear you. Make some noise. Hey, beep, beep, here I am. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> you follow me? I'm on this road, but my destination is heaven. You know, hey, make sure they see you. Get the big picture. Defensive driving as, is, as, as it is applied to the Christian life. See, friends, we, we need direction. In this life, it it's changes. Our plans change. Our journey changes. Things happen. And in the midst of the storm, because that's what was happening here, in the midst of the storm, the storm is all you see. Under these conditions, Paul, uh, Luke writes in, in verse 20, there was no sun nor stars in many days, King James Version. No sun nor stars in many days. In other words, there was no light. Many days. You, you know, uh, there's no direction if there's no light. I can't see the sun and I can't see the stars. For you and me, that's not a big deal. But when you're in the and a boat, a, 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 a vessel in the ocean, in the sea, and you're trying to follow a direction, no sun and no stars means you're lost. No GPS. You know, uh, you know you, you, no Google Maps. The, you're you're absolutely, you know, you... There's no way to find. There's no, no floating compass, no magnetic compass. You're looking to the sun and you're looking to the stars to find your direction. But without, with no light, there's no direction. 
and in the midst of the storm, that's all you see. And, and that's where they were. They were completely, they were without any direction. And in the midst of that, friends, we become confused, we become disoriented, we become doubtful. In the midst of the storm, when there's no light, day or night, you, you follow me? When there's no direction, your, your situation's changing, the storm has arisen, and you don't know what to do. Where do I go? Where, which way is up? Where's right, left? I don't, where am I going? Where am I now? I, and, and in the middle of the storm, sometimes, friends, that and the confusion comes in you, and you panic, and we, and we lose confidence. We lose confidence, we become disoriented, and we become doubtful. We say, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. Luke said, all hope was gone that we should be saved. It was taken from us. All hope that we were going to be all right. What are you hoping for? Or for what are you hoping to be grammatically correct? What is it, what is it that you're hoping for? Where's your hope? 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Paul says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. In the context there, he's debating, uh, he, he's arguing for the resurrection. He's saying there are some that say that there is no resurrection. He said, but if there is none, if there is no resurrection, if we don't ri rise from the dead, if there's no life after death, then there's nothing that matters. Everything we've been preaching, everything that we've been living, it's all a lie. It's all for naught. We die and, and, and there's nothing left. And, and there, he said, so, so our hope, if we have hope in Christ, but our hope in Christ is only in this life, everything's going to work out for me, I'm going to get my degree, I'm going to get my, chomp chomp, my successful business, I'm going to have, you know, the kids are going to be great, and I'm going to build the house, and I'm going to have cars and a drive, everything's going to, if, if our hope in our Christian walk is only in this life, then Paul says, we are miserable. Of all people, we are the most miserable. See, Paul's awareness of the resurrection not only impacts his perspective on the present, it motivates him to live the Christian life under all circumstances. He's saying, no, I have a hope. I have a hope in Christ here in this life that he's going to take care of me, protect me, provide for me, you know, all those things. But you know what? My hope goes way be in Christ goes way beyond this. I'm hoping for, I'm, my destination is heaven. My port of call is heaven. And when all this, no matter what, when all this is over, I'm going to arrive safely in, in my destination. He says, I have hope. My hope is, but it's not just here. My, my hope is, is there. See, friends, we do have hope in this world, in Christ. Don't let anybody take hope away from you. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I know for some of us, the way we look at things, things look bad. Things look hopeless. I know we, we see the darkness. We, we, we see confusion. All we see is the storm. We say, oh God, we're, des we're, we're, we're destined to destruction. Our little ship is it's done. All hope taken away. Friend, listen. Our hope in Christ in this world, that means that he will provide, he will protect, and he will guide us. Now, there may be things that are good that happen, and there may be things that are bad. But our hope in Christ is not in this life alone. In fact, it is predominantly in eternity. When what we hope for does not come to fruition, we can lose hope. Well, I was hoping this would happen, but, it, but it's hopeless. I wanted this, but no way. And we, and we lose hope. We lose that sense of hope. And we say, well, it doesn't matter now. It just, it, nothing matters now. And we lose the big picture. Right? We lose perspective. We lose the big picture. Listen, never allow Satan to paint your picture. Someone said he doesn't use bright colors. When the devil paints the picture up ahead, oh, this is where you're going. This is what's going to happen. He never uses bright colors. It's always dark and dreary. Never allow the devil to paint your picture. He knows where he would like to see you, 
And you know where the devil would like to see you? In the hamster wheel. You know what I mean? I hate when that happens. The hamster wheel. Well, if this happens, and this is going to happen, and then that's going to happen, and boom. Oh, no, no, I'm going to try this. I say, I'll try this, and then if I do this, I'll do this, no, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this, this, and this, and this, and boom. And I'll, 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 let me try to think of another solution. And we go, and we go through uh, all the solutions in our mind, and, we just, and we're just, we're on the wheel. Just, we're, we're going, 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 and going nowhere. That's, Satan loves to put us in there. He loves to put the dirty, dark image in front of us and say, it's hopeless, it's gone, it's over, you're finished, and, uh, and now you're going to try and figure out a way to make it work. He, don't let the devil take hope away. Listen, um, verses 22 through 24. I'm sorry, I closed my Bible. You are with me, right? <laughs> See, I didn't even have to ask. <laughs> Verses 22 through 24. And now I urge you, Paul says, take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Don't be afraid, Paul. Fear not. God has a plan. God is never caught off guard. Nothing takes him by surprise. It doesn't matter if we know what the plan, if we know the plan at this point. How many think you, you knew what the plan was? <laughs> you think you know what the plan is? Uh, yeah. And friends, uh, we are generally wrong. Armchair quarterbacks, you know. We call it from where we're sitting. We don't have the big picture necessarily. And we, we generally call it wrong. When it relates to God's plan and purposes, we're pretty much always wrong. <laughs> Because God doesn't follow any, you know, perceived plans or schemes of men. He does what he does. And for his purpose. So we don't have to know what his plan is. We just have to know that he has one. Amen. God's got a plan. Sometimes we're told, in this case, God sent a messenger, an angel, to talk to Paul and say, Paul, don't worry about it. Here's what's going to happen. The ship is going to go down. But nobody's going to be lost. Everyone is going to survive. He gave him instructions and he told him what was going to happen. In the absence of such revelation, know this. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So if I don't have new orders of the day, I'm going to fall back on my general orders. And I'm going, to consider, I'm going to continue to do what I know the last thing was God told me to do. The last thing God told me to do was not to be afraid that he was going to lead me and guide me and I was going to make it home all right. And unless he tells me something otherwise, I'm going to continue on that journey. That's what Paul, this is what we're, we're hearing here. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good... Did God begin a good work in you? Of course he did then he will perform it. He will finish it. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until that day when you make it home into your port of call. Friends, either he is faithful or he isn't. I'll try and move this along. Oh, wow, does time go by fast. Paul, Luke says that they were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea. 14 days. Two weeks back and forth. Do you know what that means? That means they are out of control for 14 days. The wind is carrying them back and forth, up and down. They can't make headway. They can't, they're, they're, they're driven. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Your present circumstances do not alter God's plan one bit. However you got there, whatever, doesn't matter. 
in God's plan, not one bit. Here, it says that they cast anchor, actually four anchors. They cast anchor and wished for the day, hoped for daylight. Sometimes that's all you have. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's, Lord, I throw out my anchor and just, I'm just praying for daylight. That's all I have. I'm completely resourceless. And I'm just hoping to make it through. I'm, you've been there. God, just get me through. Sometimes that's all you have. They prayed for daylight. That's a very good idea. Lord, just get me through. In the midst of the storm, Paul gives thanks. See, he had the big picture. Listen, this is so important. Paul had the big picture. This is his fourth shipwreck. Now, allow me a little poetic license. I think possibly the first time Paul wound up in the sea, he might have been thinking, I wonder if I'll survive this. People die out here. Hyperthermia. I don't, uh, is anybody going to rescue me? I, am I, you know, I going to drown? I, I, am I going to make it? You know, I've never been here before. I don't know what's happening. I, I imagine he might have been concerned. Am I going to be all right? Am I going to survive? The second time he's in a, a, a shipwreck, you know, maybe he's thinking, well, maybe I'll get through this one too. Because I got through the last one. Maybe I'll get through this one too. I'm not sure. But, you know, I made it once. Maybe, maybe I'll make it. The third one, I could just picture him sitting back, floating, saying, I wonder how long this, and this one's going to take. You know? I, you know? I just wonder how long. That's all. And then the fourth one, I imagine by now he's just like, praise God. Backstroke. Why? Because I've been here before on several occasions. And God has rescued me each time. I'm not going to worry. I'm not. I've been, you know, that's the person I want to hang out with. I want to be with that person who has the experience, who has the, the knowledge of God's presence. He's the right guy to, to talk with in, t in times of trouble. That's the person who I want to give me advice. Right? Like I say all the time, show me your scars and your trophies, or your medals and your scars, and I'll, hear, I'll listen to what you say. Because both are important. I want the medals to see the victories, and I want the scars to, to know that you've been through the battles. Then I'll, then I'll listen to you. This, guy, this giving of thanks in the midst of the storm recalls the Last Supper. In the middle of all this, he says, let's break bread and let's give thanks to the Lord. Remember, Jesus said, do this in memory of me. In trial, friends, there is the sweetest fellowship with Jesus. Paul said, because I know whose I am and who I serve. I know that he's present with me. Thirdly, it gave way to the wind. I was in one of the most confusing, scare I, was in a, I was in a storm, as it were, without light by day or night for many days. And I called my former Bible college professor, Dr. Ruben Sequeira, and said, Dr. Sequeira, I don't know what to do. And this situation is overwhelming. And in his Massachusetts, California accent, <laughs> He sounded like JFK. He's got that kind of accent. He says, Mark, abandon yourself to the wind and pull up the rudder. <laughs> like, wow. Abandon yourself to the wind and pull up the rudder. Exactly this. He said, you know, there comes a time when fighting is futile. I, mean, I got to go this way. I got to go this way. Well, the winds are contrary. It's futile. You just pull up, the, pull up the, the anchor, pull up the rudder, and, and let the wind drift, let the wind drive you. That's what they did. Why? Why? Because in John's gospel, it says the wind 
bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God, He drives us, He leads us. He, you know, pull up the... You know, pull up the rudder, pull up the thing, and just abandon yourself to the wind. Lord God, you're, I'm yours. My life is yours. I gave my life to Christ. I don't know where we're going. I don't know how we're going to get there. All I know is you know, and I'm abandoning my life to you. I'm opening up my, my sails, and the, let, just let the Holy Spirit bring me where you want me to be. I'm in yours, your control. Listen, the ship was lost, friends. The ship was lost. Make application wherever you want. The ship was lost. It was shipwrecked. It was broken apart. It was smashed. You say, wait a minute. Pastor, wait a minute. I was told when I signed up for this, when I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I asked God into my heart, and I gave my life to Christ, I was told that it was going to be smooth sailing. I was told that God was going to be in control of my life and I was never going to have to worry again, that He was going to provide, sustain, protect. It was all going to be good. I, I signed up for that. Smooth sailing, luxurious cruise. But hang on. The story doesn't stop here. A ship built only for fair weather is not seaworthy. You could, you could build a ship out of, you know, you can glue it together with that stuff they sell on TV, you know. Cut a boat in half and glue it back together and you could, it's fine. Down in Black Pond on a sunny day. But, but in the ocean, in the storm, it's not going to make it. And a, and a ship built only for fair weather is not seaworthy. And fair weather Christians won't make it. Because the sun doesn't shine every day. I just was looking for a, a smooth ride. I was just looking for God to help me. That's all. Somebody told me, try Jesus. <laughs> Listen, we all will face violent storms along the journey. I promise you. I guarantee. Verse 23, Paul says, But I know whose I am and whom I serve. Amen. To the Christian who tries to live the Christian life and still own his own life, God seems afar off. But whose I am says, Wherever, whenever, in whatever state, Lord, I believe in you. Amen. And the boat was wrecked shipwrecked. But they floated in on mere fragments of the broken vessel. And just as God had said, no one was lost. Listen, friends, the ship may be broken to pieces. Your personal vessel may be broken to pieces. The vessel that you were riding on might, might have just been shipwrecked. The hopes that you have might have come to an end. The storms came and it's over. But, friends, the Lord, whose you are and who you serve, stands with you. And sometimes that's all you can hope for. Listen, grab hold of something and hang on. Amen? Amen? Grab hold of something. Grab hold. Some swam to shore. Just some... Because they could swim. Others grabbed a hold of parts of the broken ship. And, you know, dog paddled their way. But they all, they all were saved. All of them. Grab hold of something and hang on. Brokenness. Brokenness. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. Brokenness can be a good thing. If you just hang on. They escaped all safe to shore. Listen, as I close, some of you may not have that assurance. You say, it's falling apart. It's all over. I don't know what to do from here. I've never seen anything like it. I'm scared to death. I have, I have no direction, no sun, no stars. 
Winds drive me back and forth and my boat is sinking. Whose I am and whom I serve. Perhaps you've never really trusted him with the whole journey. Not just on the sunny days, but in the storms as well. Maybe you haven't put your confidence and your hope and trust completely in Christ. Others, you're watching your vessel, your life, your world fall, fall apart, and you've become fearful. Listen, grab something and swim to shore. The boat may be gone, but, but all those who are in Christ, all those who are, who are on the journey are going to survive. All those who are on the journey are going to make it. If you just hold on, just hold on. Stay with the rest of the passengers and you'll make it. Remember what, they, what, what Paul said? They were going to jump ship. Paul says, don't, you'll be lost. If you jump ship, you'll be lost. Don't jump ship now. Stay on board. Stay with the crew. Stay with the rest of the passengers. And, and God will not let you drown. Amen? Amen. Not going to let you drown. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, God, for this beautiful picture of this man of God and all the ups and downs and all the trials, the disappointments, the, the defeats, the shipwrecks. And yet, Lord God, you brought him through. And you brought all those with him through. I pray, Father, that my brothers and sisters listening to this will make application of this word, that you'll speak to them, God, in whichever way through this message that you need to. But I pray that each of us would be encouraged. There will be no loss to those who are on board, to those who have embraced Christ, to those who have given their lives to Christ. There will be no loss. I pray, O oh Lord God, that you'll help us to understand this, that, that the one whom we serve, the one who we belong to and to whom we serve is with us and will be with us through the storm. I pray, Lord, your will be done. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.